everybody. Welcome to another episode of Carolyn Talks Television. I'm Carolyn Topol, and I'm here with my lovely co-host, Rachel Arnett. Hello, hello. <laughs> and we're here today to talk about more competition shows, but of a very different nature than what we talked mm -hmm. about previously. This time we're talking about, <clears throat> dare I say, one of my favorite subjects, competitions on cooking shows. And there are so many good ones to choose from. You know, I didn't realize just how many there were spread out over o over all the network shows mm -hmm. that you could literally probably watch a food competition all day long if you really were interested in doing oh, it. Oh, absolutely. And if not, there's always ones that are on demand. So, there, of course, yeah, because <laughs> we all have to have our on demand. Well, I'd like to start today with what I consider one of the pioneers that really gave I would say a little bit more than a nudge, maybe a little kick to the U.S. Mm -hmm. When we started seeing on the Food Network, Iron Chef, not Iron Chef America, folks. The original. The original the one, Iron Chef. The only, with the chairman. With Yeah, with the chairman who eats his whatever he's eating. His red pepper, Red usually. pepper, green <laughs> pepper, whatever he was. And all I thought it was... <gasps> Why would you do that? There's seeds in there. <laughs> That's true. I never thought about that because it was just this beautiful, uh, wonderful moment of character. Just <laughs> And everybody I... would say, ah, cuisine. Yes. <laughs> but for those of you who are a little less familiar, Iron Chef is a program that we imported. Mm -hmm. And what happened was there's a series of the standard Iron Chefs that they had. And they were they were the steady ones. Yeah, they were there all like the time. American Gladiator, where you always had Thunder and Rocky, or you know. And in fact, one of the original Iron Chefs was Chef Morimoto, who also became an Iron Chef in mm -hmm. our later version, which was Iron Chef America, which became our show in the U.S. created by Food Network as a spinoff, basically. Yeah, and it's interesting because the actor who played the chairman in Iron Chef America was kind of styled as the nephew of the original Iron Chef yes. uh, chairman. And it wasn't the case, but it still was this like kind of lovely bit of theater that connected fans of the original to people who enjoyed the, or the American version. And the concept was so much fun. Here you have these chefs considered these the best chefs in the world. Mm -hmm. Or at least according to the show, they're the best chefs in the world. Mm -hmm. And you had to rate as a chef to compete against them in what amounted to basically a one hour competition with a secret ingredient. Now, for the few of you who have never seen or heard of Iron Chef um, and have been living under the ground for the past <laughs> 22 years, um, the secret ingredients got very creative. I mean, they yeah. would go from a secret ingredient like um, you know something wonderful like steak or mm -hmm. or shrimp or something that or was really creative something yeah um, and then they'd start to get into some really unusual things um, down to like a vegetable and whatever the secret ingredient was it would have to be the star of each of five creative dishes that the chefs mm -hmm. would have to compete against one to one and many times you would have some of the craziest ice cream flavors so that they could oh, even do that became desserts. like an, an ongoing thing almost like a meme on the show that someone always made ice cream and they always waited to the last second and there was always this tension of will the ice cream machine work today and of what the ice cream was like for example if your secret ingredient was asparagus you were going to make asparagus ice cream and all i thought of was i really like my ice cream but there's just a level to where <laughs> there, you have a to line. draw a line. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Asparagus ice cream, just the thought is not doing it for me. Now, but one then, of the things yeah. that I've loved about the Iron Chef, the original, as well as, of course, the Iron Chef in America, which is hosted by Alton Brown, mm -hmm. who is a very famous uh, Food Network chef, mm -hmm. um, has had several of his own shows, um, not necessarily competition, so we won't chat about them today, is that the judges on the shows, on the show themselves, were either chefs themselves yep. or if they were an actor or somebody very famous, they were somebody very famous who is a passionate foodie. Or connected in some way to a restaurant, a restaurateur, a food critic. So they had people that were genuinely knowledgeable 
and could provide commentary that was interesting as opposed to just tastes really good. I like it. It's pretty. Yes. Like there were those elements, but they spoke with the vocabulary that actually helped me understand the cooking and presentation process a lot more. That's so true because they never just left it as yum, <laughs> which is probably where I would I be. Ooh, yum, pretty yum. Yeah, exactly. and and I'd be like, Same. okay, I'm good. Um, but they really knew the nuances mm-hmm. of cooking and of presenting a dish that was special, and we got that benefit. And the other thing that I loved is it really gave me a sense of what the process looks like because you'd have the head chef that was competing, right. but you also saw the sous chefs that they would set aside and say, okay, you're only working on frying the asparagus. You're working on chopping the leeks and whatever it is they had their individual tasks, but you saw the head chef doing a lot of the cooking and also the management of that little kitchen area. And it really gave me a sense of what truly goes into food production. Yes, and haute cuisine, because yeah. everything they were going to give had to be, you know, truly the top of the line of food. Yep, the and, and the whole time you're going, you have the running commentary, and you have Alton Brown going around and filling us in on what we're looking at. So you're, even as much as it's just fun and it looks delicious, I learned a lot from the show about cuisine. And, and it was almost, we were given a play-by-play. Yeah. It was like, watch, it really was, they called it a... Um, a stadium. Yes. And it was like watching a sports event. I watched it with my whole family. Mm-hmm. None of us were bored who had formally said, oh, a cooking show. It wasn't just a cooking show. It really was a great competition with great skilled people in mm-hmm. the field. And then eventually it led to Next Iron Chef, which allowed people to compete in order to become one of the Iron Chefs. So they we're able to really expand the family of shows from Iron Chef, Iron yes. Chef America, Next Iron Chef, and each one really built on the other very nicely, I think. And it truly demonstrated the top chefs in the U.S. Mm-hmm. because those are the people who were competing to become part of the Iron Chef yes. team, where they would be the ones everybody would come to compete against. Um, and they were cycling people out as certain Iron Chefs went on to more things. Yep. Um, one of the most famous Iron Chefs who has certainly expanded mm-hmm. his realm is Bobby Flay. He was on that show and he was always someone that was very interesting to watch. And it was also cool because you got a sense of the chef's type of cuisine. And it was cool to see them try and fit the ingredient into that. So he would always do like something Southwestern with some kick and some like really home style cooking. And it was always looked delicious. But you, it was just really cool to see in the way that singers have their own style of singing, they have their own style of cooking. You know, that's interesting. I, I didn't think of it that way, but it, yeah. it definitely. And Bobby Flay really got his start on Food Network at Food Network's earliest age. Mm-hmm. He was one of the pioneers in Food Network when <laughs> my guess is he was barely out of culinary school mm-hmm. or maybe even still in it. He was very young. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he, he was a kid. By comparison, and now he's basically the, the top of the pyramid at Food Network mm-hmm. with those who have retired bef- you know, before him. Um, I believe in terms of truly the top of the pyramid, just for anybody, here's our little tidbit, Emeril Lagasse was, oh, the, was the top of the pyramid of Food Network that truly yeah. gave it its push forward where it became a popular place to turn to. Mm-hmm. Um, but Bobby Flay going on also has many shows he's been a part of. Mm-hmm that are competition shows, including ones now that even have his name, Throw Down with Bobby Flay, which has actually done its time. I think it was on the air for like three or four years, three or Mm -hmm. four seasons. Um, And oh, he did part, he was one of the people who did Worst Cooks in America. Which I love With Ann Burrell, it's Chef Ann Burrell's show. And she is I'll let you tell a little bit about that (laughs) show. So the thing that I love about the show is that you have Chef Ann Burrell and a co-judge. They, um, it's kind of like the voice where they judge and also mentor. Yes. Um, people who are self-styled, self, um, self-titled self worst chefs in America. People who, I remember a gentleman who used to cook salmon in the dishwasher. He would put it in a certain container, make sure there was no dish soap in there, and cook it in the dishwasher to steam it. 
Um, I missed that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kind of glad, actually. <laughs> There's a vision going on in my head that it was, yeah. none of you want. Just trust me. Okay, go ahead. And, and as part of the audition phase, you know, they have to come in and present a dish to the chefs. And I remember the judges taking a bite, and then he said how he made it, and they're just... <laughs> <laughs> and immediately and and they don't hide their disgust they don't try to be very very nice they're never mean mean but they you know they'll say this is not good what are you doing I remember another woman who came on and as long as the food wasn't moldy she would still serve it and sometimes even if it was she would just like trim off the mold and yeah, it was not great yeah, no, no, no. but they spend weeks and weeks teaching them cooking skills everything from how to cut basic julienne skills to making very complex recipes mm -hmm. and okay. it's it ends up being really inspiring by the end because they usually end by cooking a big meal for their families and you see these families come in I remember one mom and her children are just so overjoyed that now mom can cook <laughs> and it ends up being really sweet and they have all these emotional moments where people connect to why they want to cook in the first place a family member that's passed or a recipe that they used to love that they've never been able to replicate. And it has a lot of emotional components too. And the nice thing for these people who are truly amateur cooks, this is not a fake. No. They bring, they're bringing in amateur cooks. And these two really amazing chefs are the ones who are their judge mentors. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they're competing against each other, having the final person who they feel is has risen mm -hmm to the top of their team's pyramid, once yep. again using that analogy, yeah. but truly risen to the top, and they compete against each other, and the chefs have to just, could coach them verbally, but can't touch anything, mm -hmm. in a <laughs> restaurant environment, yep. and it's a blind, it's a blind judging by three chefs who are experts mm -hmm. in the fields of cooking that maybe they're gonna be involved with, and decide who truly wins the competition, and there's cash involved. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they spend maybe six, eight weeks, and you end up with $25,000 if you've done yeah. it right, and, you know, bragging rights. Yeah, exactly. It's always the bragging rights, even if you get to the final. Exactly. If, you're, if you're the other finalist who did not win, you're still gonna have these bragging yeah. rights. And every once in a while, they even had an uh, Worst Cooks in America Celebrity Edition, and that was always fun, because you got to see celebrities instead of at their most glamorous you got to see them uh -huh. kind of falling apart a little bit in the kitchen and getting to see yes, that yes. side of it was always really nice uh, and you know and the funny thing was some of the famous celebrities i mean i still remember watching people who i thought probably would have <coughs> never made it past the first week mm -hmm. i saw janet jackson cook i never thought i would see janet jackson cook yeah if there's this new vulnerability when you see someone struggling with something that you only ever see at the top of their game. I mean, Janet Jackson is incredible at what she does. I would have thought my brain had her is she can do no wrong. Yeah. But she can do no wrong when she sings and is on stage performing. Clearly in the kitchen, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. She could only do wrong until the <laughs> show. And it was really humanizing, I think. And... It, it, it helped like us that. relate to characters, yes. to characters, to the celebrities that were on the show. I agree. I agree. Now, you brought up a show that I have not watched as often as mm -hmm. I would imagine you have. You shared with me that one of the shows you wanted to chat about was the competition show Top Chef, which I know gets a lot of publicity. Oh, yeah. The thing that's different about Top Chef is these are all chefs. These are trained chefs who know what they're doing, have studied in France, have studied in England, have studied in the U.S. Some have won James Beard Awards. And this, and by the way, yeah. is, I believe, on Bravo. This is a yeah. different network. This is not food. Not everything we're talking about is food network. Yeah. This is on Bravo. Yeah. Go ahead. And you just see the most incredible dishes come out of the kitchen. Um, some chefs who've come out of the show have then gone on to win James Beard Awards. And as they're watching, you also see that they make mistakes. And that's also helps you relate to that as well. You see some of the most incredibly, incredibly wonderfully trained chefs making little errors, like not cooking the risotto. Never the risotto. It's always, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's the risotto is the ice cream of that show. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's watch out for the risotto. Um, and it just, again, you get to watch brilliant chefs make brilliant food and 
see them support each other. They add, of course, being a competition reality show, they had the personality elements. So every once in a while, there's a villain of the show because he wins a challenge or she wins a challenge and gets to give someone else a disadvantage. But really, more than anything, it ends up being about the cooking, which is always beautiful and looks delicious. Well, and the thing is now, in that particular show, when you become the top chef, is it also an elimination style? Because a lot of these, um, while I, while um, Iron Chef was not elimination, it was a one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. competition, and somebody won and somebody didn't in the end. It was based on points that the judges on the panel would score. Yep. Worst Cooks in America was an elimination show a week at mm -hmm. a time. What is uh, Top Chef? Top Chef is elimination as well. And then you eventually come down to the final two, who, very similar to Top Chef, then have to create this full meal. And i be honest, I don't remember if there's a secret ingredient piece to that, but I remember that they have a certain amount of time to prep an idea, and then they have a certain amount of time to execute that idea with, again, the judges making the final determination as to who wins. So it's not like something okay. like American Idol where the audience calls in because we can't taste the food. Right. Exactly. Well, I'm glad because one of the things that always um, gets me in competitions is when there's popularity contests for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And the thing that I love about food competitions, um, cooking show competitions, is you don't get that. Yeah. You don't it's get that. It's about the food, and it's about how well it's presented, how well it's cooked. And generally, from most of my experience in viewing, as a, as a TV viewer like everybody mm -hmm. else, I like to see what an expert is saying mm -hmm. about the food and how it has passed muster. Absolutely. I, the thing about American Idol and other shows like that that always bothered me was, like you said, the popular vote would come in and someone would get saved that didn't necessarily have as good a week because they were really cute or really sweet. And I think that that matters, but if it's truly a talent competition, in this case a cooking competition, I want the experts to make the decision. And I agree with that. And I, that's one of the things I've liked. Now, one of the things that I found interesting is a show called Chopped, which is a Food Network show hosted by Ted Allen. Um, who some of you may remember from years ago was part of the original um, uh, Five Guys, the Fab Five from oh, Queer yeah. Eye. Yep. Um, and cooking is one of his expertise, um, and it truly is an expertise. And he is the host. The panel of judges are three um, chefs, mm -hmm. uh, frequently chefs who are Food Network. Uh, chefs who are, you know, who have other shows on the Food mm -hmm. Network. So they're recognizable faces, which yes. is nice. Yes, and, um, and in fact, they just added a new chef who, a new chef to the judging panel from time to time, which um, for me, the jury's out. Oh. It's I, Martha I, Stewart, for anybody who had, didn't, didn't know that. I didn't know that yet. She, Ooh, she just started this week. Okay. Um, so for me, the jury is still out. I'm a Chef Guarnaschelli fan, so. Oh, uh, <laughs> Alex Guarnaschelli. I love her. Um, yes. She gives very direct feedback and very kind feedback, I think, where she'll make a suggestion instead of just being like, this is awful and I don't like it. She'll say, maybe if you had roasted the cucumbers slightly more. You know, well, I have to say, I, she's, she's amazing. Yeah. She's amazing, but she also is very critical when she needs mm -hmm. to be. Um, I think she also just has a flair for really tasting things that are so nuanced. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating, and she, like many of the chefs on the Food Network, has a restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, they all, many of them, are restaurateurs, and have been executive chefs of their restaurants. It's not just I bought a restaurant and yeah. hired staff. Exactly. I own a restaurant and I'm the executive chef. They make so the, the menus. So the stops here. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yep. Um, and one of the things about Chopped, though, and this is my pet peeve, mm -hmm. and I think part of it is because I do like. And they all lived happily ever after. Yeah. That, that's, that's, you know, in my fantasy, if I see a movie where they all lived happily ever after, even if the movie is terrible, it gets a little bit yeah, of exactly. a bump up at the end. Like, okay, it. Whew. good yeah. ending. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, Chopped, they tend to be a little bit, mm, can be vicious. They can yeah. be mean. Like, 
you know, I've heard people say, like, they'll start and they'll do the nice, nice thing. And I, you know, I, I taught. And I remember at, at teacher conferences, you're supposed to start out with the nice stuff about the child. <laughs> Even if you thought the child was definitely never had any redeemable qualities, you'd have to say, I love how he dresses when he comes to school. Or something. You make Fine. a compliment sandwich. Compliment, difficult statement, compliment. Well, except in this case, they start out, compliment, I love the way you got your uh, meringue all frothy or whatever it is. <laughs> and frothy however, meringue. I don't know what you were thinking adding this flavor. It absolutely destroyed your dish. And I'm listening to this thing. Huh, someone just told these unknown chefs mm -hmm. who are the ones competing. Yep. It's four chefs and they're competing in a basket of ingredients the mystery that are basket. mysteries. It's a mystery yeah. basket they open on it on the chop show. The con the contest is starting with four, going down to three, two, one. In a one hour program, mm -hmm. they have to make generally an appetizer, a main dish, and a dessert mm -hmm. with three different mystery baskets. And at the end, of course, the dessert is only down to two chefs competing. Mm -hmm. But the mystery generally those baskets have. Some real fun stuff. Um, they have wonky ingredients that frequently they'll take something out and it looks like something I saw in the movie Jurassic Park. Yes. Um, and was clearly from a prehistoric time that they someone dug up somewhere in a, it, in a national yeah. somewhere. I've seen some strange, like a sample mystery basket. We'll get, we'll each get, um, chicken hearts. Okay. And licorice. And in the same basket, by the, the way, basket, what she's saying yeah. is like they'll put these in the same basket and these chefs will have to figure out in 20 to 45 minutes, depending on yeah. the, the part of the meal it is, how to make them a cohesive dish. And I'm thinking, why are they criticizing them? They tried something. They tried, like, red vines and pineapple and also dried fish. <laughs> and it's totally what they, like that's an actual mystery basket. Right. I, you know, I... And, or I love when they like will throw in for dessert something like um, pickles. Yeah. Or sea urchin. And you're like, okay. And then something else in dessert is a ready-made frosted cake, but they can't serve it as a ready-made frosted mm -hmm. cake. They have to deconstruct it and uh, repurpose it. Yes. Uh, and it's just, that to me is probably one of the most difficult shows that I, I see. I think so. Because you have to you don't get really freedom of thought in the way that, you know, Iron Chef, it's one mystery ingredient. You can use your own style of cuisine. You've got a whole kitchen available to you and people to help That's you. That's true. I hadn't and thought of it that way by Chop, comparison. It's three to four ingredients that you have to use all in one dish. And they have to somehow be, um, I don't want to say visible, but you have to be able to taste their they have presence. To be present, yeah. Present. Yeah, they have to be in the dish and you can't hide them. And mm -hmm. actually, if you forget an ingredient or try to forget an ingredient, <laughs> um, you're called on that. Yep. You're called on that. So, you know, and, and that could be something that will chop you from the next round. That's the whole concept is there's like this meat cleaver sticking out of the wall <laughs> on the set, which is yep. part of the set, and you would be chopped. Um, I'm thinking off with your heads from Alice in Wonderland, yes. <laughs> but no, it's not. It's just... Yeah. Off, off the kitchen, <laughs> off the yeah. kitchen area. Um, and I, I do like, I think it's given a lot of newer chefs or, or amateur cooks, they have periodically done amateur cooks, um, exposure in a really nice way, um, bragging rights again, like you said, and whatever, whoever the chef is, if they work for a restaurant or if they have their own restaurant, they always mention that. So it helps provide some... Advertising. Some advertising for them so as well. So while, while they're going out of their way to do this and compete, and there's only one prize at the end, one person will get $10,000, which is big for one mm -hmm. show. Um, I think the publicity for their restaurant, their business, mm -hmm. um, frequently sometimes it's for a charity if you have celebrities compete. Um, I've also seen where they did um, school kitchen chefs. Oh, nice. Which yep. I thought was lovely. School, stu, uh, school kitchen ladies, which I thought was a yeah. lot of fun. Something I don't want us to forget to talk about is with all these wonderful fun shows, and there's a whole lot of them, I'm going to throw out a couple of names for you, some that are currently still on the air, Guy's Grocery Games, Guy Fieri, mm -hmm. he just... 
<laughs> he's everywhere. He's everywhere, and he can make you smile. Yeah. His shows, is, are, there aren't put-downs. There's mostly smile and upbeat. He doesn't do the, I'm bashing your dish if I don't like it. He's more like, mm, that's an interesting flavor, <laughs> is what his judges will say. Once again, all the judges being um, chefs or food critics who have a great deal of acclaim. Nobody's on that show judging people who doesn't have the right and hasn't earned the right to be there. Yeah. Um, and I like the concept of that show just because it genuinely takes place in a grocery store and it's stuff that you can find. And it, which is a lot of fun. And, and, and it, I think it helps the home viewer see that you don't have to get the absolute most gourmet of ingredients to make delicious gourmet meals. Right. And his challenges include things like, you know, how much you can spend on the meal and things like yeah. that, which is a lot of fun. Um, but there's also kids shows. I love them. They're so cute. Oh. And this is where we don't get any insults. I mm -hmm. think it's really sweet. For example, there are things like baking championships on the Food Network. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, and there's MasterChef um, on, I believe that's on Bravo or one of the other networks. Mm -hmm. um, and these have junior versions. MasterChef Junior consistently makes me cry happy tears. These kids are so cute and they do their little, you know, the little introduction packages. They're like, I've been cooking since I was three. I'm like, oh. And they're it's like making like handmade ravioli. And I'm just trying to boil spaghetti. You know what I mean? <laughs> and they know things about food too. Yeah. Um, and it, it really is lovely. And generally the people who are judging them are people who you could see have soft hearts. Mm -hmm. You know, they are soft with them and they understand and there's, I, I just know, for example, on um, the baking championships, the junior versions, Valerie Bertinelli is generally oh, one okay. of the judges, and frequently she is called upon to hug a crying child, mm -hmm. even though they haven't insulted them. They just had they to get taken off that yeah. week. Um, there's so many. Uh, some of my favorites have been competitions where people do blown sugar work. Mm. And they still do repeats of these. Yeah. So if you can watch the Food Network or any of these cooking channels, the Cooking Channel, the Food Network, there's a whole variety of them, Bravo. Not only are the challenges interesting, fun, creative, mm -hmm. but they also are eye-opening and informative. I've left saying, wow, I will know that if I ever have a bottle of truffle oil in my house, mm -hmm. not to go overboard with it. Yes. You know, things like that. Yep. Um, Make sure if you're going to make risotto, you give yourself plenty of time. It's not <laughs> something you're going to do in 20 minutes. Don't try, especially if you're a home cook. And mix the ice cream. And <laughs> mix the ice cream and get it in the ice cream maker before you only have 60 seconds till the end of the competition. <laughs> in case you're ever around an ice cream machine. Right. Yeah. So for that, I'm going to say I'm going out to a restaurant. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to make sure I get really good quality food because I have a feeling after this, my head is going to spin and I'm going to say, oh, look. There's nothing in my fridge. I'm going out and finding exactly. one of these people who could win a competition. So, Rachel, this has been a lot of fun. We're going to yeah. have to talk more about cooking shows in the future. Oh, absolutely. This was just the competition end. And so, Rachel, it was a lot of fun. And Carolyn Talks Television had another fun segment. So we'll see you next month again. Bye-bye. <laughs>